it's seven o'clock um so um let's make a start uh hopefully more people will be joining my final message went out on facebook at dead on seven um so for those of you that have joined already uh welcome to uh, april's horsemanship hour live you can see a few more people starting to join um so before we start i'll just point out a couple of features of the webinar so first of all if you're on a laptop the video screen is on your left and the other features are on the right hand side if you're on a mobile or tablet then the screen's at the top and the other features are below so you'll need to scroll down to see those on the main screen you'll see a big picture and then the little pictures which is philippa mel myself and kate and you can make any of the little pictures the the big one just by clicking on them you can also make uh, the screen full screen uh, by clicking on the the little red arrows in the top left. Um, we will be sharing some diagrams today, so you'll probably want to use that so that you can see them clearly. Um, but when you're in full screen, you won't be able to see the other features. So if you do want to join in the chat or ask questions, then you'll need to come back out of the full screen mode. Um, so as I've mentioned, um, there's a chat, uh, there's some questions, and there's also some polls. So feel free to chat amongst um, yourselves and introduce yourselves in the chat. If you have a specific question for us or Philippa, then put that in the questions tab. It just makes, us, makes it easier for us to find it. Uh, we'll also be using some polls today, so keep an eye out for those as well. Uh, so that's the housekeeping. <clears throat> so Horsemanship Hour Live is hosted by Horsemanship Journal. Today you have myself, Teresa, our CK, and Mel from the advertising team. And our guest today is Philippa Christie. So we're going to be talking about horse development um, and specifically the impact that competition has on that. Uh, Philippa has been writing a series on this topic in the magazine. The first one was in December. Uh, the second part of that series is in April's issue, which we're posting this week. Um, so today's art uh, discussion will build on that, but you don't have to have read those two articles um, if you haven't already. OK, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Philippa to introduce herself. Um, and then we'll dive into today's topic. Thanks, Mel. Uh, thanks everyone who's come along to join as well. Um, if you don't know me, I so I am a bit about me and my background. Um, I've so I'm an equestrian for over twenty years. I'm a registered equine psychologist, professional member of um, ISIS as well, which is the International Society for Equitation Science. It does get confused sometimes. And I study equine anatomy with the College of Equine Studies as well. Um, I became most interested in equine anatomy when I saw um, an initial diagram. I don't know if you've seen this before floating over Facebook, uh, showing the stages of equine development. It was by a lady called Naomi Tavian, and she's based up in Italy. And uh, I got in touch with her and I said, you know, uh, could we get a high resolution version of um, the tennis? Take that off for me. Uh, can we get a high resolution version of the picture? And she said no. She kind of just done it in Photoshop, so in in, in Word picture, uh, paint probably. So I took that on to my backgrounds in graphic design as well a little bit. So I took that on and, and remade it and shared that out. Um, and that went out to 1.2 million um, over Facebook, which was pretty huge, really. And uh, we we sold hundreds and hundreds of them around the world as well, which is great. And uh, we do actually have a copy of that poster going in the next issue, I believe. Uh, so you'll be able to, if you, if you subscribe to the magazine, you'll actually get a free A4 version of the poster. Um, mm -hmm. We're working on as well, getting, getting a, a little intro, a little A3 version as well in there. Um, so, yeah, so I saw this poster. It kind of got me excited and I thought, let's learn a little bit more about this. So I went off and I researched a, a study that the original poster was based on. That was a study by Deb Bennett. And there is a link to her study uh, in the next slide that's coming up, which is about growth plates. So I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, when I when I research, saw her research, read, read through it, I was just, you know, I was just blown away. Uh, for me, it was really groundbreaking and I just wanted to understand it further. And that's when I enrolled in the level five anatomy course, um, just to go go away and learn a little bit more. So, you know, I'm not a doctor of equine anatomy. I don't, don't kind of profess to be. What I what I do is I, I research an awful lot and I've got a real interest in the subject. 
and specifically about development because I see the poster and I see lots of people posting, but I don't see any specific research apart from Deb's research into into ages and how that relates to competition as well. And it was interesting for me doing all of the research for this talk that I couldn't pin down any research on the longevity of equine health in relation to when horses were ridden at particular ages. So it must be a tricky study to do in all fairness. I don't know if it's possible, but I think it would be uh, really interesting nevertheless. So um, when I, I went and did this course, we examined x-rays, we dissected lower limbs. It was pretty good parts of it um, and it just got me so excited and I just had to go and learn more so today we're going to talk about um, development so that's referring specifically to the musculoskeletal maturity um, I'm going to be focusing the talk specifically on the development of growth plates okay um, so to understand the possible impact of training for a specific sport or industry I'm going to firstly look at the development of the horse's growth plates. Um, so if we can bring the slide up for the growth plates up on mm -hmm. there, it would be really good. Okay, so this one is actually taken from, directly from the, the study by Deb Bennett. And um, you can see at the bottom there, there's a link to that uh, timing and rate of skeletal maturity. Um, it's a fantastic uh, report there if you can go away and read it it's really actually an easy read and I'm going to be quoting quite a bit from it this evening as well as <laughs> quoting about 50 other references as well um, so just to take you through so the actual growth plates themselves so they're located within the bone um, the bone development begins as cartilage and through a process called ossification uh, it eventually fuses so this means the softer cartilage in the bone. So we can see there on the top one, the neonate and full. Um, so that brown there, okay, uh, that's, a, that's the central part. That's actually a cavity. That's the cavity there for the bone marrow. But as you can see that um, as, it, as, it pushes, as it's pushing out there, um, the, the plates at the end get smaller and smaller. Um, I've actually got a different diagram that's in the magazine as well that I'm kind of reading from a little bit here, so it's a little bit of a different image. But once the growth plate is sealed, so the growth plates are at either end of these bones, and they start off initially. The best way to sort of describe it is I'd like to take this bottle, okay, and this lid. And when the when the growth plate start at, starts out, okay, it's kind of a bit loose. You can take it off. Um, when when the horses have been dissected and the bones have been cleaned and removed, you can actually take the growth plate away from it. It's not fused at all. But when that growth plate is is finally fused and ossified, you've got it's strong. It's one. It becomes one with the whole bone. It doesn't become apart again, and it can't be seen under X-ray either. You, there's a little black line that you can see in the X-ray, and that disappears as it fuses. Okay, so. We can see as well, this, this is because of the next slide, the stages of the development. So this is the A4 poster that you'll get in the magazine. Um, it's pretty in depth, as you can tell. Um, this one's labeled, okay? So the previous one that we did, uh, that we put out on Facebook, it wasn't actually fully labeled with the skeleton, or the skeleton or the bones. Um, and I, so I hope that helps. I hope it helps when you see that it's both colour coded and labelled. So starting at the bottom and working our way up, we can sort of see the development starts. Uh, it's really with the now the pedal bone. The pedal bone's an interesting one. This has changed quite a bit since the initial post that I put out because the pedal bone, although the growth plate fuses at birth. It, the pedal bone itself developed so significantly that I actually wanted to change that because a lot of the time we kind of hear about, you know, the hoof's deformity, people wondering why uh, the hoof is, is developing and, and deforming at certain ages and, you know, shoes have got a part to play in that um, as well as other factors. But the pedal bone there, so it might be fused, but it's not finished actually growing in girth. 
and that's true for a lot of the all of the bones actually so that the growth plates can fuse um for example on the cannon bone at um around one year to one and a half years and then the actual girth of that cannon bone will keep growing till the horse is about five years old so that's quite a that's quite a significant amount of change the bone's going to undergo mm. and that is again that's girth so one of the things that uh, can happen especially in in a sport if we're, if, we, if we're training let's say we train one-sided we train to the right all the time you know we talk about asymmetry in horses and where does this come from well the asymmetry can start initially at training so if the horse is uh, box walking, even example, so stereotypies, box walking is a is one. Uh, if the horse is doing a particular motion, they're going right in a circle, they're going right the round pen, they're going right around the stable, box walking. Over a period of time, that will have a, a significant impact on the bones. As, as the bones constantly remodel, uh, you'll get one-sidedness, okay? So you'll have development on one, one side of the bone, but not as much development on the other. And when you think about the ligaments and the tendons, the muscles, how everything's attaching, it's going to be asymmetrical. Uh, so, and that's that's one of the things they found. So, that's kind of an important thing to remember, really, when we're looking at when we're thinking about the training, especially in racing, for example, where the horses are generally tend to do, you know, they go a certain particular way, don't they? So that can be have something to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you, but yeah, just moving up so you can see kind of working at the knee and going up there. This kind of can be a bit shocking in some respects, because if we look at sort of the vertebrae, like the thoracic portion, the sacral caudal portions there, they're like six years old. You know, between five and six years old is when we see these growth plates fusing. And up until that point, they can, you know, you, they can slip. They can slip. Right. Yeah, it's especially when the actual, so the, the saddle portion is your, mainly your T10 to T13. So that's the, that's the real brunt of the weight sort of tends to tends to go uh, all the way back to 80. Um, that part is five to six years. And the amount of back problems we see with horses, you know, you do question, is it is it related to, I did a bit of research actually on this. Um, and I can tell you, just bring it up there. Be very, very uh, patient with me for a moment. I think this is really significant, actually, when I read this. So there was a there was a study in 2016. They they looked at back pathologies of horses, and stress fractures of the back and pelvis uh, were the one of the biggest ones and then the ventral spondylosis which is uh which can be seen in in the cervical vent, uh, vertebrae which we can see there tend to fuse at around about three years but it can even be longer so if the horse is longer necked then that can actually be a bit longer and that's why we see the th um the t1 to t t9 thoracic portion of the spine that's even that can even be late it can be as late as eight to nine years which is you know again so we're going to look at different sports so i just want to kind of say that and kind of absorb that absorb those ages and now let's think about that in relation to what the horses is how the horses are performing and what age they're training at um and that's i'm not i'm not going to make a judgment on that that's not what i'm here to do what i'm here to do is present the evidence and then you go away and you think about it and think, you know, what what's your response to that? And does it make you think differently about the training that you do? You know, will it will it make you think differently about sports in general as well? And the diagnosis of horse pain, horses that you've had that you think, you know, that maybe you're going through diagnoses with your own horses at the moment or, you know, somebody that is, you know, it's it's although it's not helpful in the sense that it's past and you can't change it sometimes it can help us when we're coming to diagnose and if we can learn as well from mistakes i think that we can repurpose and put a positive you know on it so there is going to be a positive outlook at the end where we're going to talk about some positive changes that have been made and also some organizations that you can support and sign up to even some of them for free just to sign up to see what they're up to um 
and petitions and things like there's there's lots of things going on and i think that the equine world's really proactive now at, at looking out for horses and the more that we learn uh the more that people are starting to uh to share the information and i think that's really important so so that really concludes this this portion i think what have we got a, is it what's up next is there a question and answer um, yeah, so we have one question so far, um, and I'm, I'm not sure you'll know the answer. But I'll anyway. try. <laughs> um, can asymmetry start in the womb? Ooh, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know, it's a short answer. However, is there any research that's been done on that? It's, it is a really good question. Um, I think I think when... In the in in the womb themselves, the, the there's not none of the growth plates have actually closed at that point. The the type of bone remodeling that's going on, I mean, I don't know what factors could affect that in the womb, uh, genetic possibly predisposition. I mean, we're all we're all to some level asymmetric. What I'm talking about is unnatural asymmetry. So asymmetry that has occurred because of an unnatural event such as walking one particular side. So I think it's we should all expect horses to be asymmetrical to some extent but then you can you know uh i did rehabilitate quite a lot of x-races so with my mum when i was younger and one of the things we found with the x-races is that they had a particular side more so even than you know normally they have even if you lunge them or you go out your school in they, they always have a side where it feels harder to you know you work the softness isn't always there and things like that so that that's normal but then you get horses that physically aren't just a little bit tense or a little bit you know they're really struggling like they're physically struggling and and training is not going to change that that's the difference if a horse is just you know a little bit asymmetric and it's a case of you need to work on the muscle if you're working on changing muscle uh, that's a huge big difference between changing that and, and bone that's remodeled that's that's a lengthy you know 18 month process to change that if you can change it at all you know, mm -hmm. although bone does remodel, it, it it does slow down over time. So when a horse is particularly been doing something when it's very young, okay, then it's going to take longer than it took in the first place for it to get back to being, you know, just back to being where you were in the, in, to start with. So um, rather than just being a little bit asymmetrical, you've got a horse that's really out. And that means that they'd really, they'd physically be unable to turn. They'd physically be unable to to take the this this particular lead because they physically can't do it. That and that's the big difference between that and the horse just having a, a slight muscle issue. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question at all? Anyway, I hope so. <laughs> uh, so uh, Philippa asked that question. So if you have any follow ups, then uh, then let us know. Um, so the other thing I did was push the first poll uh, cool. where we asked whether people think that. Uh, different breeds age um, at different stages. Um, I don't know if we might have a quick look, see what everyone thought. Yeah, I've been so just... few, yeah a few not sure and yeses. So I think we've probably got about half and half maybe of yeses and no noes. Okay. So can... Well, let's keep that open. I think we'll keep that open while we go, and it'd be interesting yeah. at the end to see to see that. Um, okay. So I think we've got another slide because I think before we're going to start, I'm going to get get into some sports um, as well. Um, so kind of got a few questions, and and it'd be good just if you if you hit in with your if you can on your buttons. So what age do you think this horse is? So we're just thinking about our own eyes and how trained we are to look at horses and ages. <clears throat> be interesting. We got, let me know when some hopefully rolling. Just give it a guess. <laughs> Edu an educated guess. <laughs> it's not like at school where we're all looking at you, you know. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're right, wrong, or indifferent, you know. It's, it's, it's just interesting to see what people think. So it ranges from three um, all the way to six. Wow. Okay, so let's reveal the answer then. <laughs> so this, so this horse is actually two years old. Wow, and has actually been training for around about six months. 
So mm. two years old, yeah. So it's in, yeah, it's interesting. They 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 can look. That that was one of the things that really brought it home to me. Doing the course, the lady running it, she was very passionate about this. And uh, we looked at different like uh, horse confirmations, different breeds, and and you know none of us got it right. We all thought the horses were older. So it's good to know it wasn't just our group. <laughs> we weren't just <laughs> exactly, you know. Um, so we next slip to the next one. Yeah. Okay. So what age do people think this one, this horse could be at? And don't just go guessing, you know, because you try to do it based on the other one. Just have a look <laughs> and just think about it, you know. Uh, it's the same breed as well. It's not obviously it's not the same horse. It's not the same colour. Um, <laughs> it's not even the same breeding. It's not from the same stud. It's not you know not even from the same country. So it's not about confirmation or anything like that. It's about looking at how developed the horse is. Yeah. I think it's amazing how much, depending on what work the horse is having, that it's going to build muscle that maybe is going to trick us into thinking they're a different age. Yeah. Hmm. Well, in, you know, in the wild, they need to build up muscle pretty quickly as well, because from birth, they're a prey species. They need to run. They need to be able to cover vast uh, distances for water. You know, we saw a video of lots wild horses been popping up with all this uh, isolation going on. And somebody commented how fit the horses were. You know, these wild horses, they look so fit. We don't know, obviously, the ages of them. Yeah. But... Uh, being from the, they couldn't distinguish the young, you couldn't really distinguish the younger from the older. So, have we got any age guesses? We have, so we all think this horse is a bit older from looks of things. Um, so ranging from six through to 16. Wow, I hope my horse looks like 16. <laughs> 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 That's a good one. No, I mean, they're, they're educated guesses, you know, because obviously this horse is much more developed. So, this horse is actually eight years. Eight years old. Right. And they're both fillies as well, I'd like to say. Uh, fillies. Do you think, sorry, Philippa, do you think there's a psychological element for humans as well, though, in the sense that to look at that racehorse, if you weren't familiar with the racing industry and the practices there, we'd mm. automatically assume if a horse is in work, it's going to be of an older age. Yeah, I think, I think so. And uh, definitely the research suggests as well that, uh, you know that when when owners are, are spoken to, that they just believe that the horses. You know, and actually, in all fairness, the the trainers believe that the horses are fully mature to yeah. to run as well. Uh, if we go to the comparative slide, so we skip two slides. So we we'll go through the age one. Should be uh, one. this one, and then the one after that should be comparative. Okay. Yeah. So when you look at them side by side, that's when you see the huge difference. Yeah. And if you if you looked at a race track and you raced three year olds against eight year olds, you would see a huge difference. That's why they generally tend to group them into ages. I think. Mm. I think it's less obvious. That. But uh, you know, starting off thinking about racing, um, the horses are generally start training around about eighteen months old. <laughs> And they, they start racing careers at two. They generally tend to peak at three. Um, if we pop over to the next slide, there's a few key facts about racing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, right, okay. So, yeah, so before we before we head on to the racing there, so a few factors to consider. So, obviously, we're talking today about training, age, uh, the amount of training that they're going to get, the quality of, of the training and the discipline uh, that they're training in. All of those things will have... Uh, an effect on on the development of the horse and we're going to cover those in each one but we should also consider these other elements as well so breeding is it is important in terms of development because uh in terms of asymmetry as well and we know you know the genetics do play a part in in deciding what bone's gonna gonna model where and things like that uh, nutrition is a huge one i can't we put this in the last uh, the last one and it's gone in again because nutrition is such a an important part that you know what you feed your horse really does affect how it grows and horses that undergrow very fast growth spurts and then don't grow for, for a long time again that's where we tend to see the problems um because the but the bones just it's just gone under you know it goes under too much strain too quickly mm -hmm. Uh, too much happens in too much short space of time and if the horse is in training while that happens 
then we can see problems. And that actually had that issue with one of my own horses. Um, she just went under, undergrew a, underwent a massive growth spurt when she was uh, around about four. And we think that that um, has something to do with a, a actual trap nerve in her neck because the 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 bone, the how the bone kind of modelled. We do think that there was a bit of an issue with that. But I will get into it, but it, it can lead to quite big issues as well. Um, management, so stabling, too much stabling, not enough stabling, you know, where the balance is with that. It's not a debate for today at all, but it is something to consider. Uh, the amount of turnout the horse gets and also the hoof care. So there, there is something, you know, um, I hear all the time thoroughbreds can't go barefoot because they've got bad feet. But most thoroughbreds, especially off the track race thoroughbreds, you know, they've been shod since they've been a year old. So, you know, we talk about the pedal bone and the development, so there could be a trend there and, you know, things like that. So not, I'm not saying concrete that that is it, but there are factors there that, you know, are a little bit outside of what we're talking about today that, you know, will, in, will have some impact on the development and we just don't have it pinned down to exactly which bits are affecting everything but the training itself does is a really good way of being able to break down because you know they can survey dressage horses they can't necessarily survey horses that have been shot at a particular age unless they've been following that horse from its first shoe so mm -hmm. you know then those those re that research hasn't been done um yeah med so any medical factors as well injury if they're receiving treatment so if the horse is developing and they've actually got an injury, that's going to change. They're going to, um, you know, make up for the injury somewhere else. So you get bone modelling somewhere else, prob probably most likely on, on the lower thoracic portion of the spine. That's where they generally tend to make up for any leg injuries as well. Um, and that's when, again, we, we, we do wonder the link to that and kissing the spine. Um, and equipment, tax, and aim as well. So, you know, if you're using a saddle that doesn't fit, obviously that's going to have consequences. If you put a saddle that doesn't fit on a three-year-old, it's going to have consequences. And we just don't know that these horses that we're looking at in the different um, in the different disciplines, we don't know for certain what training that they've had, what tack that's been used. And we'll just like to assume that the right tack's been used, especially if they were, because we're looking at elite athletes. So, you know, we like to assume that they're going to have the best care and the best management and, you know, the best tack. They spend an awful lot of money researching and getting good tack. So, you know, we do like to assume the best. <laughs> Let's be positive on that on that front, you know. So uh, we're going to focus mainly, though, on the training and the types of training that they enjoy and how that can have an impact on them when they're younger and see if we can, if we can find out if that will impact them. As they get older. Okay. Okay. Um, so before we start talking about um, the training, which is the main topic, so we do have a question. So um, one of our viewers has an ex-racer, <clears throat> five-year-old, um, and they're kind of wondering what the effect of feeding vitamins and minerals um, will have. You know, how much does mm -hmm. that help? And it just depends on what vitamins and minerals were fed at what time. Um, I mean, at five years old, you've still got, you know, you know, you've still got development going on as well. Um, your horse is probably going to grow for at least another one to, to three years, develop, even in girth, if not up. And uh, I think that when it comes to vitamins and minerals, we have to be really careful. There was a really good, and I don't mean to plug somebody else, but there was a really good talk yesterday on, on hay and what we're feeding horses and actually vitamins and minerals, you know, I think we have to kind of bring it back to you know what what is their main diet there's there's a lot of a lot about that and I, I think that sometimes we can be overfeeding our horses um as much as you know we see underfeeding especially in performance we get overfeeding I think we've got that anticipation of I need the horse to be bulky I need the horse to be big I need my horse to look like everybody else's horse and actually if you do too much too soon what you might not see right now could be a knock-on effect six months down the line six years down the line um, and so on and so we will kind of see that effect I think especially race horses have they they undergo a lot of feeding at very young ages and it's it's very unnatural the amount of protein that they're, they're given to build them up to build the muscle that they need to race so yeah uh, I'd say consult a consult a nutritionist that really knows their stuff I'm not a nutritionist so I won't say exactly what vitamins and minerals your horse should have 
Okay. Fair enough. Uh, right. Next oh, one. We've gone yeah. halfway through this time. Oh, there's a giveaway. <laughs> yeah, I did mention this in a few posts, people. So just to thank you all for joining us, I wanted to do a little giveaway. And so what you get in the giveaway is I have, uh, so I've written a book on um, bitless bridles and uh, bridle fitting and bridle anatomy. And there's a DVD as well with um, how to, to train your horse. It's actually, even though it's for bitless, it could be used for any any training as well, do you know? So if you're starting your horse off in a halter, then use, you know, you can use this information for haltering and it's all about using softness and gentle, gentle um, natural horsemanship approach, okay? And there's a goodie bag with that. Uh, there's a pen in there as well, an equine partnership pen. And then this very special device. I don't have very many of them, so you're very lucky to be getting one of these. Uh, this is the ISIS, so again, the, the group that I'm involved with. Um, I'm a practitioner member, I should say, is uh, this is a taper gauge. It is, so this this portion here measures uh, your noseband tightness. And you've got these little roundings here. I don't know if you can see, I'll try and make them very clear. That, that measures your bit thickness, okay, as well. And we can measure shank length. And it's just really handy, you know, especially the noseband tightening, or if you're doing anything to, to, to do with bridle fitting with your horses, it's just a really helpful tool to have um, and these are really hard to get hold of they only made a certain amount of them so we're giving that away as well so the whole package together i think it's worth about 60 70 pounds and and the postage is included anywhere worldwide as well so if you um if you do ask a question if you've already asked one or you do ask one throughout this the talk uh, you'll automatically get entered and one of the gang will pick out a name at random at the end and we'll just get in touch with us with your address and I'll post that out to you tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we've covered the Q&A. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, we had a real world. You had some good questions there. Um, yeah, so, right, so I want to share some key facts. So um, now actually the horse in that picture there, that's a three-year-old horse. Uh, I was going to use that as a comparative as well, but that horse looks, I think that horse looks older than three. I was quite shocked when I saw, you know, this is a three-year-old. Um, so interesting that the peak performance of racehorses is four. They usually retire around about five. And um, what the research did indicate is that at eight years old, there is a dramatic decline. So that's <laughs> when you get things like diagnosis of osteoarthritis. Uh, you know, ser serious things that, you know, can not completely incapacitate, but might stop your horse from being ridden, such as, you know, severe cases of navicular laminitis. Um, the 90%, 97% of all of the injuries and the, the issues with, with racehorses is musculoskeletal, 97, which I thought was quite shocking. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so there's different so different races as well, the horse. So you've got things like the Oaks, Derby, Derby um, 2,000, 1,000 guineas, they're for three-year-olds. Then you've got your groups races, which is for two to four. And then you actually have your jump. Now, your jump races, those start till the four. And they generally tend to last a lot longer in sport. So they can be they can be riding away till they're eight to ten years old. But yet your other races are having to retire at four or five years old. Mm -hmm. so I think that's an interesting... Mm -hmm. Yeah. An interesting one there. Uh, the most common injuries with your with your thoroughbreds are ligament tendon, long bone fractures, buck shins, chip fractures, um, and shin soreness uh, was present in just under half of the horses of horses that were, went through this study. Um, the horse, so horses that began training at two years of age, forty two percent had shin soreness, and three percent and the three year olds um, had their lameness issues were most related to the knee problems. If you think back to that diagram and you think back to, you know, when the horse is two years old, um, that is, generally speaking, from the knee down, that's fused. Um, but you have to think about, the start, if they're starting to race at three, they're actually going in at three, and they're starting the training at 18 months. At 18 months, that knee is not, is not ready. So by the time they're three, you know, so by the time they're three, you're starting to see knee problems, yeah. which is quite sad. Mm. Um, 
I was looking through I have a few studies here. Um, there was a really good mention in the in, in the diabetic research that I want to share that um, some of the research that's already been done has been misappropriated by um, by some trainers that have kind of suggested that by working the horses younger that they actually uh, make the bones stronger or that there's some insinuation that the horses will mature quicker in terms of the bones, the bones will be stronger. And it's, yes, the bones will become, they will engirth, they will increase in girth. The, the plates won't, the plate growth, fusion, all that will not change based on the training, mm -hmm. but there the will be extra bone because the horse is going under stress. So if the leg's going under stress, which means the muscles are growing. The, bo the body needs to support those muscles by growing uh, extra bone. Uh, so we do see bone remodeling taking place. However, the, the leg isn't stronger. Mm -hmm. And what we do see a lot of is stress fractures. There's lots of little stress fractures that can come through. So if anybody says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm doing loads of trotting work with my horse to strengthen their legs up. Um, it's just a myth. It's, it's not strengthening them up. Uh, what you might be doing is building up more bone, uh, but if you're not doing that training uh, very balanced in, in a balanced way, what you could actually be doing is is causing additional asymmetry. So you've got a horse with asymmetry, getting your training more asymmetry into it, and then you you know uh, you've got even more problems than when you started with. So and when we can relate, it, we can look at this. We can look at every discipline and relate it back to our horses and what we do with them. And, you know, think about the training that we can do and how we can help them. Um, and essentially, especially when it comes to things like wanting to strengthen the legs, wanting to add more bone. So the best thing we could do is leave them alone. Leave them alone. Don't try and don't try and do that because it's no, there's nothing there's nothing to accomplish with it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, was it? Was the other thing was. Uh, Yeah, the RSPCA did a did a really good survey in two thousand and two to two thousand and three to look at why horses left the racing industry in terms of in terms of medical reasons. Uh, Thirty one percent um, actually stopped racing just due to injury or illness, but the RSPCA didn't clarify whether that meant that the horses were just retired or whether they died. Um, and apparently, nineteen percent of horses were rehomed to for equestrian equestrian purposes. Don't know what quite what that means. Um, but then, you know, there was a, there's another charity for retired racehorse project, and they said that um, the biggest cause of horses being euthanized with them is uh, arthritis. So, and that's for newly retired racehorses. So, horses at five years old with arthritis is something they shouldn't be getting at, you know, under 10 years of age. You know, and if you think about it, if you think about children, if you, if you think, I thought you were a child or a child, or a little kid playing with arthritis without having some sort of osteo um, this, uh, diagnosis going on, mm -hmm. then, you, you know, you'd be questioning what that child's doing. I think there are questions whether or not gymnasts, you know, stuff and ballet dancers, things like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, although they are athletes, you know, um, we do have to question if the horses have a choice for this and what happens to them afterwards. So many wonderful people are re do, do rehome and rehabilitate, but they're left with a lot of vet bills, a lot of vet bills, a lot of problems. And, you know, and they're spending, they spend the whole life trying to figure out how to help the horses. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the good people, <laughs> the good people, and they just, unfortunately, they don't really deserve what, what they're kind of left with because at the end of the day, it's mainly tears. You know, so when you are, you know, it's great that people do rehome them. Um, and they, obviously they need somewhere to go and do take them on, but be aware of these are the things that, that you're going to be met with. And you need to have, you know, there's no point somebody who doesn't have a clue going on Facebook going, just just rescued a retired racehorse, never had a horse before, don't know where to start. You could probably do it more damage than you could good. So, you know, if, you, if you're thinking, oh, I'll get a race, an extra racehorse because it's cheap and, it's the best way to go. You're gonna, you know, yes, you'll learn a lot, but you'll also be very sorry for it in the end. Or you, you know, in terms of what it could cost you, 
uh, financially and also what the amount of rehabilitation that the horses need is is quite significant um, for what they're undergoing. So the beautiful horses, um, I've had several myself and I've rehabilitated and rehomed several, thankfully, that didn't have too many problems. Um, but just do be aware that these, you know, these are the statistics and these these are what they're undergoing, that they're undergoing this training at, at 18 months. Bearing in mind, it is gradual and the jockeys, I mean, the saving grace of it is the saddles are light. The jockeys are light. You know, they are not running them for anywhere near as long as they used to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they are making improve. They are making improvements. Um, I think that needs to be noted as well. But do they need to run at two? Do they need to run at three? You know, that's. I think that's the question. Do we? Do they need to do that? You know, who who's going to be the biggest loser? You know, if they do race a five year old and it is going to be slower. If you if they're all five, they're all going to be slower. So it does, yeah. does it matter? They're all five, they're all going to be slower. There's this need for constant perfection of age. And, you know, if, if somebody gets caught racing a sulky down the road here in Ireland, which we've seen quite a lot, six-month-old ponies with sho shoes on, dead in the road, you know, everybody's up in arms, but then everybody's all off to Cheltenham. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? It's yeah. like... <laughs> Where, where, where does that where does that sit ethically and that's kind of the so that's part of the discussion it's kind of a hard it's a hard sell guys but you know it is it's an important discussion and it's important to at least be mindful about it especially if we're participating ourselves in in any of these um disciplines and you know what we're you know if we go and enjoy a day at the races you know maybe we maybe we'll go to races for for all the horses or the the jumping or maybe we'll look at the race going on decide what that we agree with you know and I think if we're just aware of it at least we can make at least we can make pieces so well, I, I want to do this and yes not everyone might agree with it but I understand it and I still want to do it you yeah. know then then that's that's totally up to you and I'm definitely not here to judge that and that's not what it's about but at least if people are aware of it where if you said oh I had no idea the horses were this young and I didn't want to go then at least you know now yeah so any questions from the racing portion of, of the talk? Try uh, so, yeah. yeah, we have one question, not necessarily related to, to racing. Um, so Sandy said, over the years I've had two ponies um, that had to retire with hock issues in their late teens. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have them until they were five and nine years old. Um, is there anything specifically that I possibly did or could have done that caused this? Um, or is that likely to be an age thing? Uh, so the hocks, so the hocks are actually kind of the tricky thing. The hocks do do uh, tend to develop a little bit um, later than other parts of the leg, and they are a tricky area. Um, excuse me. She doesn't obviously say what discipline. I'd like to know what discipline or what was done. Uh, with maybe you riding club activities. Riding club. I mean, if she's had yeah. them from from birth, I mean, obviously, what what age were the horses started, and how much intensive training? Are not intensive as well um you know the the age at which we start the training will be a, a big factor in in things and also genetically there can be issues as well you know bear that in mind not absolutely everything is down to the, the environmental factors you you do have to consider um i mean that age is young to have a hawk issue um what you know if you, when you think that they're only just the hawks will be developed at five and if the hocks have developed and there's been something going on for a year or two uh, where the horses were, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly, we're getting to this with dressage um, and show jumping because they, they both work on this premise that we're, we're trying to lift the horse at the front and get them to work more at the back. Pony club activities, were you doing lots of dressage? Were you, was it all about getting the horse underneath themselves? Um, the, so that's that's where the, generally the hocks tend to, tend to suffer, jumping. Is where the hocks can can suffer a bit as well. So, um, how many, how often were they being ridden? How big were the kids that were riding them? That could you know did adults ride them? I don't know how big these ponies were, so I don't want you know. There's there's lots of factors there that you consider. I don't think to sit around and and blame yourself too much. But if you kind of look back and think, well, what what was I doing and when was I doing it? And 
Um, did, what did I do differently with the two horses? And were they owned by somebody else before me? Things like that. And, you know, did they have any injuries, any kicks in the field? That's something that can happen. It's very common. Um, if, if something, if they've, uh, they've hurt themselves getting out of a trailer or in the stable, you know, it's not, it's always difficult to pin it down to one thing because the, the research we're looking at here has been quite specific. Um, yeah. But so you can never pin it down. Answer. You're looking for patterns, do you know? Mm -hmm. So obviously I haven't got a pattern to, to put your particular scenario to. Yeah, and in this case, it sounds like um, she didn't own them until they were older, so probably doesn't know. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know that's what happens, especially with ponies. Uh, they they stay in the home for a particular length of time. You know, the kids get bigger and bigger, and then all of a sudden they're too big, and then they move to the next home, and they get bigger and bigger. And what sometimes can happen is the kids don't want to sell them, and the big kids ride them. Maybe and and because they're confident kids, they maybe do a little bit more than what they probably should, and you know. And we don't always appreciate how long they should be ridden for as well. You know, how long they should be ridden for at particular ages. Are they coming back back into work from the previous home? Um, it's very easy to do too much too soon. And actually, we'll, we'll, we can touch on that as well, like the difference between um, elite and non-elite athletes and, and, and horses and what the differences are between, you know, in, in terms of injury and, and issues with the horse. I want to move on really quickly because we have... Yes. Way exceeded the time for things. So, it's fine, it's good though. Uh, jumping, so jumping a little bit later. So, I'd begin training was three to four. So, I had uh, I looked at different trainers and what they sort of suggested. Some trainers were saying, um, th uh, questions popped up there. Do you want to mention the question? Oh, yeah, I've just sent the, the poll to see what people think. Cool, yeah. So, what do you think the landing, uh, the 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 loading weight is on the um, on that landing leg. And there's a picture there, you can see it. Wow, you can see that um, the tendon and ligaments working there to keep all of that together. Absolutely amazing, amazing animals, they really are. Um, but yeah, so some trainers were saying that they start at three. And one of the trainers that I got, I was really, really pleased actually. So it's a Grand Prix rider. Uh, so Willem Gen, I'm now sorry, uh, Willem, if I'm not pronouncing your name properly there, um, he says, you know, some trainers train at three, he prefers to train at four, he recognises that the horses are not fully developed till seven, you know, and he said, so even though he is starting horses at four, he said, he actually does right as well, there's a, again, there's a link to the, his reference for extra reading, he, you know, he's saying, you know, ride for short periods of time, don't do too much, you shouldn't be jumping at this age, he would then start his horses at four, and he would would add the jumping later in the season so where he might just start his um light ridden work at, in, at the age of four they wouldn't start doing the cavalettis till right at the back end of the year and then he might take them to a a, a really low down a really small sort of competition at the end just to see how they progress and then they'll start at five you know start the season properly at five show jumping was an interesting one in terms of, of competition in Ireland, with the Dublin Royal Dublin Show, there are there's a loose jumping competition for horses at three, so no rider, just loose jumping, I believe, uh, from what I gathered. Uh, international uh, show jumping competitions, four years of age, and the FEI um, horses need to be seven years or above to compete at that level. Mm. So that's quite a difference between four years. Into, uh, four years you can be show jumping internationally, mm -hmm. but you've got to wait for your horses seven to, to jump them at FEI and, and Olympic sort of levels. Eight years, I think it is for Olympic. Mm -hmm. And that that's quite a way. So why do we need to start them at four if they don't need to be at the, Olymp at the, the top of the game until they're seven? Yeah. Why, why can't I wait a little bit? I mean, even though Willem sells, you know, four... Um, you know, leaving it as far, as close to that, as close to five as possible, clearly is um, clearly be a good idea. Um, if you pop onto the next slide, you can see in terms. Oh yes, yeah, so this one that was just to talk about injuries. So the the digital, uh, so the flexor tendon is was a big one. Digital digital flexor tendon was uh, the, the the biggest injury really of all. Um, and the uh, suspensory ligaments, suspensory ligament there. And you can see, and you can see how that all works together. 
And we know from the jumping and the landing as well, just how much weight is going. We're going to find out just how much weight is going to go on there. So um, I think the next, if we pop to the next slide, there we go. Uh, so this one's a quiz. So I'll put a question mark over this saddle part of the vertebrae because we don't know if this actually is going to fuse fully at between five and six. So for me, I don't want to start actually doing active jumping work until six to seven. So I'd start at probably six, really, for jumping, because at six you can be pretty much aware that you're the, the saddle part of the, the spine is going to be fully fused. But the the earlier th the not earlier, but the the T one to T nine that could be seven or eight, but it's it's as close as you're going to get. And if you're sticking to smaller cavalettes, sm small portions of training as well, so that you're not doing too much too soon, uh, you're less likely to question the 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 saddle area. And that's actually we, we've heard of hunter's bump when we think about show jumping, and just where everything works out and that one it, that did come up as one of the the biggest back problems the pelvis as well was a big one and we'll get to that in dressage so next if we want to just i don't know if many people answered the poll for the uh yeah a few of them did um we have a range of answers um most of them around the four thousand four thousand nine hundred pounds so most of them got it right. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, that's great. That means that everybody, everybody's kind of like on the same page. Okay. We'll skip the question portion on this one because we'll just get through. So we've just got three. Yeah. I'll, and I'll cover these a bit. So dressage. So this now this picture on here, this is actually the pirouette. Uh, pirouette and dressage, you probably wouldn't be doing that until you're um, advanced advanced um tests and probably your grand prix i did actually find out which one particular it was so if you want to know exactly what it was you can ask for a copy of the pdf of the talk that i have um done um so yeah so again age that they start between three and four i did find a trainer um who wanted to start you know she was very very adamant that you shouldn't be taking on a dressage horse that hasn't that hasn't started riding at least under four, you know. So they want them to be going at four. They want them to start start riding really at three. Um, so yeah, that's quite young, really. Uh, the, the competition started at four uh, years. Now your novice tests they generally tend to be um, four years, prelim five, intermediate seven, and above intermediate the FEI is eight years. Okay, so that's. A big difference, a huge difference on what we see in racing. Yeah. And even a bigger difference to what we see in, in show jumping as well. But this is the first time that anybody's mentioned eight as an age. Yeah. It's, probably, it's, the, it's the oldest, it's the oldest uh, age, really, other than, um, other than endurance. Um, so one of the theories that was kind of, I get how to dress I'd put out was that uh, heavily built horses should be started later than light boned horses. Um, light boned, heavy boned makes absolutely no difference in terms of the growth plate closure. Well, that's not going to, that's not actually anything to do with it. Uh, usually, it should start working is three or four years old when the horse is physically and mentally able to handle work. But um, at three to four, Again, we're looking back to those growth plates and the development. We know that the the girth as well, I didn't remember back to this thing about it's not just the growth plates, the girth of these bones isn't really uh, complete until five. So that's when we've got a really good area. And, and five is a great age for that because five is your your backs, you know, um, all the growth plates in the back are, are fusing and the uh, the the girth on that, on the, what longer limbs they're fusing as well so the growth so the girth is the girth not fusing but the girth is completed so we've really got a much better developed horse that that's ready to really start taking on a little bit more of a role and some and some weight there and uh, yeah i'd like to see horses ideally started a little bit later for dressage and i think that you know having tests though they started at four years old um 
even in your novice, are doing 20 meter canter circles. Um, that's quite a lot of strain. And if people are practicing, you know, canter circles at 20 meters a lot, you know, on a, on a th you know, and if the tests are at four, then they're training at three. Mm -hmm. So are they, are they putting three year olds through 20 meter canter circles? Mm -hmm. What What's the implication of that? Do you know, I don't know the answer to it because we don't know exactly the answer to it. But we do we do know that that where the developments are, and we do know what they're asking of them. So the uh, the handling, I mean, it's no surprise. It was no surprise to me to find out the handling was the suspensory ligament was the yeah, the one that undertook the most strain and was the the highest form of injury uh, because and as the picture shows, dressage is about bringing the horse's weight off the front end, putting it onto the back end. So those back legs have got to take a lot more. If we just nip to the next slide, you'll see that there's, so these horses are starting at four. So if you've got a four-year-old um, going to do their tests at four years old, their pelvis, okay, their pelvis growth plate hasn't fused, let alone the vertebrae. The growth plate hasn't. So you're asking them to take all that weight, all that load on the back on the back end, and the pelvis isn't even there yet. Mm. Okay. And then you think about your sac sacroiliac um, issues, your hunter's bump. Okay, there could be a good reason for it. <laughs> there could be, you know, that there. So, um, right, pop on to the next slide. I'll we'll just whiz through. So, in terms, so the horses are starting between three and four. Comp I was surprised the competition starting at five years. I thought that was good. Um, the three the three star distances is eight years as well, so they do take it up and up and up. Um, however, what is also interesting is that you know according to Kentucky Research, um, they're suggesting that it takes two years to train an endurance horse, and uh, but the the what's been put out as well by veterinarians is that it they should be starting the foundation training at four. Um, but if they're starting the training at four, then how are they going to be ready in two years for the novice at five? So again, well, you know, it is is the competition putting unnecessary, you know, strain and stress on the on the competitors to start their horses younger. When research places are saying you need to take two years to train your horse, and and the competition are saying, well, you need to you can start at five years. You don't have to start at five years, of course, but. There, there's going to be then pressure from their sponsors and, you know, and, and feeding a horse for another year that's not being in competition and winning prizes and things like that. So that's what to consider. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I know we'll talk as well a bit about endurance. had a lot of criticism, um, you know, over the years. Uh, we will, and, and so is dressage as well, especially the, the roll curve, we'll, we'll get to that briefly if we've got time at the end we've got two minutes to go <laughs> um i'll just throw back through to to raining so raining and this was a bigger shock for me so the age of, of raining training was it was 18 months uh to two years is when they start training and they start competing at three uh we only know that the most common injury with raining is the tarsus which um you know is again it's not surprising they're putting if you put in a two-year-old that's that's barely uh, developed on the back legs and you're putting this amount of strain under them you know and again you think about horses two three years old remember back to what we were looking at just a minute ago with the pelvis and the spine and look at the amount of load that's going on there the amount of work that's going on um i was shocked i could spend another hour just talking to you about all the the amount of information that came out about this so um well what uh, bowel racing as well, kind of that that got thrown in there. We've seen horses that will compete as two and three year olds, and they've got orthopedic problems when they are five years old. Orthopedic problems in in, bowel, in Western performance horses at five years old. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in Switzerland, obviously they banned horses competing at three, which is a great move. Mm -hmm. uh, the FEI, the FEI, you have the horse has to be seven. Which is brilliant, actually. In all fairness to the fair play at the FEI, they've said seven. The NRHA say five, and uh, AQHA it was under five. Generally, like three, four. They were the the younger sort of classes. Um, mm -hmm. 
so and I think that's why there was a big debate as well last year about whether Reining would stay in the FEI because it was about age. Mm-hmm. So, but um, fair play to them, you know, they're starting at seven. So I wonder why the FEI say you can start Reining at seven with the horses are undergoing all this load bearing at the back end, but yet dressage, they can start at five. Um, <laughs> yeah. But maybe they're not going under as much, maybe the novice, maybe the novice classes just aren't undergoing quite as much uh, load bearing as you know, as the uh, as the reigning classes, in all fairness. Um, have we got another slide? Yeah. yeah, so just to come back to this one, so we've kind of gone through it all and saying, you know, horses are starting from two all the way up to seven and eight years in competition. Uh, and when you look at this, if you think about where you want to compete your horse and what you're doing with them, and think about the, the growth plate closure, the fact that they're going to develop that girth and the bones until they're five years old at the very least and your asymmetry and, and what you're doing with them. Um, how we train our horses for the competitions we're doing and the effects that, that will have on them. Was there touched and mentioned Rolka very, very briefly. Uh, that thankfully, that now that was lobbied, that FEI Time to Act did a lot with that. Uh, they were absolutely brilliant and they, they worked really hard to get um, Rolka, so that's not allowed in the FBI. Rolka, if you don't know, it's where the horse's head is held in, you know, so so tightly, the chin's touching the chest, you know, and they're forced into this, uh, it's a forced outline, and, you know, they kept in that and, and worked in that for many, many years, you know, draw reins as well can be used in that, and so, so forth. Uh, long, deep and round as well, so LDR, that's, that's also part of it. So that's not allowed anymore, but They've set a lot of examples for a lot of years. They've set all these examples. Horses are now starting later, but they've set these examples for a lot of years. And what we've seen in terms of the elite riders that are now changing their ways slowly but surely, um, Rolka certainly has made a, a good, you know, almost disappeared off the circuit. It still pops up now and again, questionably. But we're still working with the fallout from the fact that a lot of everyday horse riders see this outline and think, I have to do this, I need this outline to win, because these guys need this outline to win. And, you know, we'll go from somebody who innocently just wants to have a great relationship with their horse to feeling the pressure. As soon as you feel the pressure of competing and having to look like everybody else, um, if you ever feel that pressure, just look at the poster. Just look at the poster and just remember that you're doing it for your horse and not for other people. Um, because that is the biggest problem now, is that vets are seeing a lot of horses that are in uh, overworked too young, that are in false outlines, and millions, $118 million were spell- spent in horse on of vet sales last year. Wow. What, what were they spending it on? What was wrong with the horses? <laughs> you wow. know, why, why do horses need that? And that was in the USA. That wasn't, that was, that wasn't, you know, considering Europe and somebody else was telling me it was five million was spent by pet plan in the UK last year. You know, what was what were these horses needing? What are people doing to horses for them to need vet bills? I mean obviously there's gonna be some things that are accidents and stuff, but you know, I'm here we're hearing more and more of horses that have that are going through orthopedic issues. Hind hind limb lameness is a huge one because again any horse that's got any sort of hind limb lameness it's con it'll um be using we're using the back as to, to make up for that um so that's that's a huge one and if anyone wants to learn more about that just check out dr sue dyson because she's kind of the world authority on handling lameness as, certainly as far as i'm concerned anyway but in terms of what you can do so if if you kind of read all this and think oh my god you know i really want to i want to learn more about what's going on with equine welfare and how we're progressing so the international society for equitation science if you go onto their website you can sign up for free updates and things that they're doing. Um, there's a statement there from the FEI that I think is really important. So especially that last one, the FEI is is the role, sole authority for all international events in dressage, show jumping, three day event in driving, endurance, riding and vaulting. You know, so the book stops with them. Essentially, the book stops with them. And if you feel that any of the ages were inappropriate then you know the best thing to do is is to join there's groups on facebook that are you know that care about equine welfare 
there's uh, there's ISIS there that you can join. You can go on. You can actually become a member. It's fifteen pound for students, twenty pound for um, for everybody else, and uh, professionals can also join as practitioner members wow. as well. And they put out research and all sorts of things. In fact, they and say they were the ones that developed the taper gauge as well. So they've done an awful lot for equine welfare certainly over the last few years. Um, they put out really good research as well. So you can check out their website for. Um, the the rollcar that I mentioned there as well they've got some really good re research on LDR and and that so so there is a silver lining that people are uh, looking out for horses wanting to make things better for horses and the fact that you've come here and you've listened to this talk means that you care about your horse and want to do better for them so you know I applaud you for that and thank you for listening to to this talk thank, thank you, you. Appreciate that. Um, and also, if anybody, if there are other people that you think would benefit from from hearing this, then this uh, has been recorded and we'll put it up onto YouTube. So if you've got friends that you think would be interested in this, then uh, we'll send you the link and send them to share it. <laughs> okay, well, so thank you. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a couple of um, last questions. Uh, we've got lots of people in the chat, first of all, saying... Um, Thanks for the talk. We've enjoyed it and found it interesting. Cool. Uh, so uh, we kind of had. Uh, so, what are the effects of jumping on the uh, thoracic region? I can't say that word. Region in the back. Um, <laughs> thoracic. Thoracic. Yeah, the thoracic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, well, again, it's, it's not. You know, think about your takeoff. Uh, think about the load bearing areas. So, um, the back itself that will that will take under a lot of strain. The first thing. Uh, with jumping is it's not so much the jumping itself initially it's that a lot of um, jumping horses undergo the similar sort of training as oh. dressage horses because they've got to be light at the front they've got to have good control of paces be able to shorten and lengthen strides so if the horse is excuse me if the horse is, is jumping under the age of five with a rider and they're doing it excessively in large large jumps then you know it's questionable whether they'll be um effects we don't know the exact effects that's that's the difficult thing and i hope the only thing i do hope about this talk is it gets you talking so when you go into forums and you see people jumping horses at three years old or you see people advertising horses as completely been there and done it all on the four um you know think about what that's going to mean for you and what it could mean for other people as well so i'm not saying you should jump on there and start being negative but you know just make a note of it and, and maybe just share a copy a picture of the poster is a really good way to silently um share information so you know um but it would be good if the more people that ask the questions the more people that raise awareness the more people are going to be under pressure to come up with this research and to be able to answer your questions so you're helping yourself and helping other people and helping other horses by asking the questions and you know getting out there and having the discussions really yeah, yeah definitely sure okay so i think that's all the questions we have time for um so thanks everyone for uh, participating in the chat um and for asking questions we'll select somebody or we'll select somebody afterwards and we'll send you a message to um to receive the goodie bag from ah, right, okay yeah. I, was just, I was just about to ask about that <laughs> let somebody know who's won <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, don't worry i'm not i'm not going to disappear with it don't worry <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much guys thanks yeah, for having thanks. me guys thanks for having yeah. the horsemanship journal thank, thank you. you so much and for coming philippa you're very welcome <laughs> Bye. take Bye. care Bye. good night